Hello, and welcome to Ask an InCamper. On this show, we go over frequently asked questions and topics that we hear from our customers and potential customers alike. Today, our topic is the basics of those tier two reports. So um, if you guys know anything about InCamp, uh, this is near and dear to Meg and Julie and I's heart. Uh, this is the first report that we automated out for our customers. So first things first, uh, let's get a brief introduction of Megan and Julie. So guys. I'm Megan Walters, Director of Compliance. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Reagans. Uh, I am a solutions engineer here at InCamp. Awesome, guys. So let's let's kind of jump into tier two. Before that, we have to talk about um, EPCRA. Sorry, guys. So, Julie, what is EPCRA? Yep. So tier two, uh, it comes from EPCRA, which is the uh, Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. So that was a federal law passed by Congress in October of 1986. Um, so this law was spurred by uh, some international and national accidental chemical releases uh, that resulted in deaths and serious uh, illnesses in you know, the surrounding areas. The most infamous uh, incident was the release of methyl isocyanate at the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India, uh, which killed 3,800 people. So in response to that event and others, EPRA was passed because uh, the government just realized we needed to have a law in place to help us understand uh, what chemicals are located where, what hazards are associated with them to prevent uh, a similar disaster in the United States. So, so Tier 2 is a part of EPCRA and specifically Section 312. So, so Julie, what is Tier 2 reporting? Uh, great. So, yeah, uh, Tier 2 is Section 312, which requires a facility to submit an annual inventory of hazardous chemicals on site that surpass uh, a threshold that is federally mandated, uh, but can be superseded by your state or local uh, requirements. So what that means is states can have more stringent thresholds for certain chemicals. Um, and you have to submit these annual inventories to uh, your uh, state Emergency uh, Response Commission, no CERC, or and your LEPC, Local Emergency Planning Committee, along with uh, local fire departments as well. So, so you mentioned something that it, it's state specific, correct, and not federally specific. So this is not like our 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 TRI, correct? Um, so it's interesting. EPCRA has a uh, kind of uh, it's basically obsolete called tier one that was required that was mandated um, by the federal government, which is basically a tier two report, but with a little less information specifically on like storage locations. Tier two came out and it requires, like I mentioned, some more additional details and all states have adopted this. So tier two is required in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. <laughs> ah, there we go. So Megan, let's say I am a um, facility manager. How do I know if I need to report tier two or if I need to create a tier two report? Sure. So it's, it's based on the chemicals you have on site at your facility and the amount of those chemicals. The main threshold is 10,000 pounds. Um, and that, that is for any chemical that requires an SDS according to OSHA. And then um, you may have another chemical called an EHS, an extremely hazardous substance, and those have lower, lower thresholds. So be sure to check to see if your chemical is on that list, which is located in Appendix A and B of those regulations. As well, check with your states because they can have lower thresholds too. So, so I know not, not every facility is required to do this, and certain industries have those exemptions. So what are some of the common exemptions that are um, you know, associated with tier two? Um, so a good example of an exemption is retail gas stations. If you are in compliance with the UST regulations, you can um, have a higher threshold of diesel and gasoline on site. Another one would be kind of the um, section 311E3, which exempts any substance to uh, the extent it's used for a personal family or household purpose. For instance, like non-industrial batteries for maybe your car. Um, and then also there's an exemption for agricultural, agricultural use, um, which eliminates the reporting of fertilizers, pesticides, and other chemical substances when um, applied, administered, or otherwise used in routine agricultural activities. 
Um, in other words, the exemption is intended to cover chemicals used in stored data form. Gotcha. So, uh, so it, I kind of mentioned this earlier. It, t tier two is different from TRI, uh, but they, it does come with its own difficulty. So, so this comes a question for the both of you. What factors make tier two reporting so difficult? Yeah, so I would say, you know, tier two is definitely uh, a little less complex than TRI, for example, but there are certain chemical nuances in varying state requirements that can make it challenging, especially if you're doing tier two reporting at scale across, you know, multiple facilities in multiple states. Um, so depending on your chemical inventory and what you have on site, uh, you may have some difficulties uh, with mixtures inside chemicals, um, aggregating uh, your total amount of EHS components. Lead acid batteries can be weird. <laughs> and then just understanding uh, your state requirements and using their portal um, can, can be challenging. Yeah, and to elaborate what Julie mentioned, uh, several states require more information in addition to the standard requirements. So for instance, Maine will require the mode of shipment, frequency of shipment, maximum capacity per single vessel, um, some other information in Ohio will request the total number of EHS and hazardous chemicals on site. Um, as well, some states can require SDSs to be submitted every year and site plans. So gathering and updating that documentation documentation can be a lot. Um, so if you're reporting for several facilities over multiple states, it can get very challenging and time consuming quickly. So, so what you guys are both saying is not only um, do the thresholds could change uh, at a state level, but they also could have different systems. Is that correct? Oh yeah. <laughs> multiple systems associated <laughs> with tier two. <laughs> Absolutely. So Julie, you mentioned something, you mentioned those lead acid batteries, which Megan has wonderfully created some content on our website about lead acid batteries alone in tier two reporting. Um, it could be kind of a nightmare and it's not always as straightforward as you might think. So Julie, what information is needed on the hazardous chemical section of a tier two report? Um, yeah, so you got to say the physical state, whether it's a liquid, solid or gas. Uh, they want to know, is the chemical pure or is it a mixture of other chemical components? Cast number, if applicable, uh, whether the chemical contains an EHS or not is very important. Uh, and then as far as quantities go, you have to report uh, the maximum and average amounts of each chemical on site uh, at any given day. Typically, companies just pick the day where they have the most um, and report that. Um, then you have to report the physical and health hazards associated with each chemical that you're getting from your SDS and uh, the storage locations of chemicals on site. And this can get super specific. Uh, for example, the state of Oregon requires you to say whether the chemical is inside, outside, what quadrant of your facility mm -hmm. it's in. Uh, I mean, Kentucky requires GPS coordinates for storage locations, so it can get really nitty-gritty. <laughs> so now that I'm a facility manager again, and Megan, I've got all this information all together. Now, when is all this stuff due? So federal regulations state that the annual report is due March 1st. All 50 states follow this deadline, except for specific jurisdictions in California. California had to be special. So California is divided into Certified Unified Program Agencies, or CUPAs for short. Some of the CUPAs require information to be submitted at different times during the year. Um, and then New Jersey even has a public and private entity which have different due, uh, due dates. For the most part though, states require the information before March 1st. So Julie, uh, so now that we have all this information, it's due March 1st. And let's say for example, I am a facility manager or a, a region manager, and I've got, let's say, 10 reports in eight states, when would you suggest that I get started with my tier two? Um, really good question. So we definitely understand your, your quantities of chemicals that you have on site can, can keep changing, but uh, the beginning of Q4 is a really good time to, to start verifying your chemical inventories, uh, your storage locations, uh, keeping track of any uh, product changes. Maybe you had new chemicals come on site that you need to evaluate. Um, you do, uh, for several states, also have to submit a site map. So if anything changed 
uh, kind of geographically at your facility of where you're locating things, you might want to start getting uh, that drawn up as well. Um, and then uh, typically the state portals uh, for tier two uh, open January 1st. Uh, one kind of nice thing about InCamp is we're always open so you can start entering in your data into our platform uh, as soon as you get started in Q4. Perfect, just, just kind of continuing on with how InCamp can help. So automated tier two is kind of how InCamp got started. So how did InCamp help with tier two reporting? <laughs> this is my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is what I talk about uh, most of my day. So uh, as we've been talking, uh, you know, there's various state portals, varying pieces of information required, all these different state nuances. So InCamp unifies all of that information required by the state. And we're gonna give you one easy to use platform for this. So you actually will never have to log into another tier two uh, portal to do it again. You just do it all out of NCAP. Um, so we're gonna validate uh, all of your data according to state specifications, um, including the documents that the state requests. Like I mentioned, those site plans, SDSs. Um, we can be a tool to help consolidate your company's products. Make sure you're reporting all your chemicals consistently across all your facilities, um, your contacts, and all of that good stuff. And then Megan uh, leads our fearless team that is going to help support you along the way, uh, coordinating implementation and submissions. And we take care of all the back end. So we do all those notifications to the CERCs, the LEPCs, the fire departments, and really eliminate all the back-end administrative work uh, associated with your two reporting. So, so you kind of touched on a sensitive type, uh, like subject for me. And even when you oh. get done with the report, you got the LEPCs and those fire districts. They can be a nightmare trying to find them. So can you, can you explain that issue uh, for our customers, our potential customers that are not using InCamp? Right, so um, we hear this a lot. How do you know where everything needs to go? Every state does it differently. So. Um, number one, even trying to figure out, okay, does my LEPC and fire department require me to send this uh, report to them? Um, how do they want to receive it? Can they accept it hard copy mail, uh, via email, certified mail? Um, several states, um, you know, you have to mail things like Ohio and Louisiana, for example. Um, and then even certain counties, um, have their own portal, like uh, Berks County, Pennsylvania. They decided they were gonna do things their way and they you have to submit through their portal. So um, trying to get that figured out can be a headache. Um, another big thing um, that we kind of haven't touched on is fees. Mm. So different uh, CERCs, LEPCs may require fees. And if you're a company that has, you know, 50 facilities in 23 states, just trying to cut all those checks and manage all that can be just a, a burden. Um, so we take care of all of that back end piece as well. Perfect. So uh, I kind of want to wrap this all up. Megan, can you, for the companies and people that are doing tier two without in camp, what are your tips for them to try to get prepared for March 1st? Sure. So as Julie kind of alluded to earlier, get started as early as you can. Uh, start gathering that data as soon as you can. The sooner you have the data in hand, the sooner you can enter your information into InCamp um, or potentially your state portal, depending on when they open. Um, but make sure you have that information gathered and ready to go. Um, and make sure you understand all the nuances that go along with reporting in certain states, lower thresholds, additional paperwork needed, et cetera. Perfect. Julie and Megan, thank you guys uh, for kind of covering the basics of tier two. We will be having more recordings as we like kind of continue through the year and get ready for that March 1st, 2020. So if you guys have any questions, you guys can leave a comment below or you could uh, go to incamp.com. We have a lot of content, a lot of resources available. You can always get in touch with us that way as well. All right, guys, see ya. Peace.